Hi, everyone. I want to thank uh, AALS, the criminal justice section, and Ben for putting together and supporting this panel. Uh, I wish I could be there with you. Unfortunately, my health doesn't permit it right now. Uh, on the upside, unlike 99% of the presenters at the conference, uh, I will be within my allotted time. Uh, so without further ado, I want to talk about some of the less obvious advantages uh, that stem from using open access casebooks. Um, so for my background first, I've, I have two uh, casebooks out there. Uh, one's a criminal law, which I'm working on the fourth edition for. And uh, then I have my sex crimes book on a seminar level course, which I'm working on the third edition. Uh, both are available very low tech uh, through SSRN. And then I make uh, related materials, including slides, course notes, syllabi, uh, teacher's manuals, uh, prior editions of the books. Um, they're available in a Google Drive folder. Um, and so somebody emails me, I email it back. Um, it's just one very simple way of, of distributing it, but it's not necessarily better than the alternatives that uh, some of my co-panelists uh, use. Um, so first advantage I want to talk about is uh, the integration of other media. Um, it's extremely effective in open access books because the emphasis is on the digital medium as opposed to the hardbound print book. Um, you can get all sorts of stuff added into your material. There are, of course, images. Um, this is These are from my criminal law book here. Um, you know, there's lots in the public domain, there's permissive licenses, or you get permission in some cases. Uh, you can have graphs, uh, of course, with color even. Color, you know, it's such a, a novel thing in our, our case books. Uh, so this just puts together some Gallup data and I have several graphs in my, my book. Um, and then, you know, because I do this, students often chip in and help. So this is a wonderful photo that a student took uh, for me in, uh, when they went to a Mexican restaurant in China, uh, which I had to question their judgment in that decision. But, you know, after I got over that, uh, I realized their photo would be perfect for a Stuart Green article at the beginning of this sort of statutory interpretation chapter about how to interpret act requirements. And here you have a, a restaurant advising prospective customers that if you're not sure if you're a prostitute, they'll help you figure it out. Um, and so, you know, this sort of thing becomes uh, a nice little give and take with students. Students want to contribute to the book. Um, and so I get little ideas, little suggestions and materials. And so those are images and media that can be added. Um, another thing is sort of summary tables with takeaways. These are very common in undergrad case books and textbooks, I guess I should say, uh, which we leave out of law school books. And I, I think they're nice. You just put them a little color and students, you know, don't have to prepare them themselves. It's not enough where they can just look at this and, and learn all the material, but it just highlights the key points. And you can see here, you know, this is the table of figures in my current book, which you don't need to, to see the details, just to recognize there's a lot. Um, the books have far more uh, visual um, uh, information than an ordinary uh, casebook. Sometimes also images just convey things far more effectively than text could. So many of you probably teach a case about drug tax stamps uh, and students are often, what, what's a drug tax? Well, including a little photo of an old one, uh, it just helps to address that. Um, my sex crimes book includes this second image here, which is a map of DeKalb County uh, with uh, sex offender residency restrictions applied. And it shows you know, the 4% of the county that's habitable, which isn't even residential. Uh, this visual is far more effective than all the textual description and just showing how residency restrictions work and why many people view them as sort of a form of banishment or ostracization. And this is the sort of things that's easily integrated in open source materials. This photo was from uh, court filing, so it is within the public uh, domain. Um, but more importantly than images is video. And video is really where I, I've worked to create sort of a seamless integration of media and the open access tech. So currently I have um, 27, 27 film clips uh, on YouTube, which are linked from the book. And you can see this is an example. There's just a, a what it looks like in the book or a view exercise. I tell them, 
look at this clip and then apply this real world statute. And so I grabbed a statute from New Jersey because it fit well, even though the actual fact patterns in New York, uh, no, no problem there. Uh, you know, these clips that I have range from 18 seconds to two minutes and 22 seconds at the outer bound. Uh, they don't take that much time, but they convey so much information. Uh, but to illustrate that, it, I want us to watch the video and see exactly how this works in terms of open access book to video to uh, student learning. So here is uh, uh, the clip that's attached to this statute. All right, 10 bucks. Come on, I'll take you for 10 bucks, but on one condition. You gotta promise me you don't tell anybody I took you for 10. Word gets out and I'm finished. I won't tell a soul. Okay, follow me. I park down the street in a reserve spot. Let's go. Come on. Watch out. Watch out. Watch out. Watch out. Suicide attempt, right? It's bigger than I had imagined. That's true of so many things in Manhattan. And the other boroughs, too. Don't get me wrong. There's tremendous things in Queens. Go to the truck here. It opens electronically from the inside. And make sure you take everything. You'd be surprised how many people are excited to be in New York. <laughs> All right, so it's just a you know little over 50 seconds here, and so much is conveyed. Um, so it's in the book, so students can go to the link and watch it before class. Ideally, they do. And then we rewatch it in class. Um, a similar text-based hypothetical, uh, you know, this is from the movie The Freshman, for those of you who don't recognize it, uh, would either tend to give away the answer because you just flag it in the way you describe it, or you hide the ball too much. It's too obscure. Um, but let me, let me return to the statute, uh, which is... Oops. All right, 10 bucks. Sorry. Uh, there we go. The return to the statute. And this is the, the slide I use, which has the same statute that's in the text. And what happens here is students, you know, I take an initial poll. Uh, do you think it's a theft? Of course, yes. They're a little confused about movable property, but we clear that up. The, the second thing is, is it a robbery? And almost always, I have zero students say it's a robbery. I might get a couple, but it's not usually for the right reasons they think it's a robbery because they don't think there's any threat of bodily harm here. Uh, but this video is great at illustrating how the, the, that you need to consider other interpretations. And even though they've just read three cases at this point on statutory interpretation of act requirements, this exercise pushes them further. And so I point out to them, You'll notice that when it says uh, purposely puts him in fear of immediate bodily injury, it refers to another, but that another isn't necessarily the same as the person experiencing theft. And there's two people in this film clip which are threatened. The one that the uh, uh, thief refers to as suicide attempt, he almost hits coming in. And then as he speeds out towards an intersection, there's other pedestrians in jeopardy. And students need to consider whether it makes sense for third parties to be included in the threats. Um, I give other examples that you know illustrate why courts have in fact said that makes sense. Um, but this lesson is very quick. It's effectively integrated in the open access text. And it's far more effective than any text-based exercise I've ever tried. And it works really well. And so I have lots of these clips and review exercises and application. And this is something that's just not part of traditional casebook uh, publication. Uh, and so this is, to me, one of the, the benefits. And so some people, you know, just use my, my film clips and use your, you don't have to use the rest. I'll talk about that more at the end. Um, but let, let me talk about one of the other advantages that I, I really think is um, understated or not really considered, which is teacher's manuals. Uh, when I first wrote uh, my criminal law book, I, I wrote a very traditional teacher's manual, um, sort of going through the book, highlighting some things, maybe giving some extra information. Um, but then I asked why. Why, why prepare it that way? Um, once we get out of sort of the bound volume, I converted things to a notes format. So this would be how I would take notes to class. Um, so it's, a professor could just grab this teacher's manual, grab the pages, and, and bring it to class with them. Or they can edit it and add. In other words, it offers a starting bit of notes or a complete set if it works for you as well as it does uh, for me. That's incredibly valuable for new professors and for people who are worried about the new prep that's involved in switching to an open access book. And you can see here when I, I return to the, the example um, we have before, this is the, the teacher's manual version. I have this sort of in italics here showing how I discuss uh, the book. And, and this is sort of, you know, my favorite teacher's manual is the Dressler and Thomas uh, Crim Pro book. And, um, you know, they often have these sort of discussions of how they teach things. And I try to include that as well. Um, so you have your notes 
you know, format and you have uh, these sort of discussions of how each of the review exercises is analyzed. And I think this is something that open access facilitates in a way that sort of a, a traditional bound teacher's manual, which you might read and then set aside. It's not in the classroom in the same way. Uh, but in order for us to make um, uh, teaching in this area more effective and to make uh, open access work, I think one thing that I would, I would implore and encourage everyone here is to embrace what Lessig called the remix culture. Um, you don't need to use the whole of any of the materials of any my book, co-panelists. Um, I know some professors just use the examples. Some use my chapters on rape. Some use my chapters on conspiracy. Uh, you can mix and match our books, put them together and form your ideal one. But more importantly, uh, you can contribute. Write a chapter. I don't include insanity in my book, but if you wanted to write one or if you wanted to redo part of mine, absolutely. I'll, I'll take it, give you full credit um, to make your dean happy, right? It would be a publication um, and add to the book. This is something, this form of collaboration uh, is something that open access really facilitates. And I hope it's something that all of you will think about and maybe contribute to in the future. And so email me. I, I welcome such contributions. I'm sure my co-panelists do as well. Uh, so thank you all. I wish you were there. Uh, hope you have a good time and enjoy the conference.